The Hoan people are, first of all, people of the land. The, uh, the relationship then is like the relationship of a mother to her son or daughter to the mother, where they depend upon the mother for nourishment, not only nourishment as far as, you know, well-being is concerned, but nourishment for mentally, nourishment emotionally. The, the island is, you know, literally alive. And so the Hawaiians on this land pick up on that energy. And um, they are fighters. They are fighters because they still see the land being, being created. The Big Island of Hawaii, the largest of the eight Hawaiian islands, is still growing and changing. Two of the island's volcanoes, Kilauea and Mauna Loa, are among the most active in the world. In 1983, Kilauea experienced its greatest eruption this century. Since then, the lava has continued to flow, destroying nearly 200 homes and the sites of potential future developments. While news reports highlight the volcano's powers of destruction, many of the island's indigenous people celebrate its power to create. The recent eruptions, which have added more than 300 acres of new land to the island, have inspired native Hawaiians who are fighting for the survival of their culture. Tourism is the primary source of income for Hawaii's economy. Every year, approximately 7 million visitors spend nearly $10 billion while on the islands. More than a million of those tourists visit the Big Island of Hawaii, popular for its beaches on the west or Kona side of the island. The Big Island is home to some of the most luxurious resort complexes in the world some featuring man-made beaches with sand shipped in from California, and golf courses created on top of old lava flows.
There are approximately 210,000 pure and part Hawaiians in the state, 19% of the population. Most of them do not share in the riches that tourism brings. But the locals know where to find the best beaches for fishing and swimming. This is the beach at Kohanaiki, also known as Pine Trees, a longtime popular spot with Hawaiians and surfers. In 1990, the County of Hawaii Planning Commission approved the building of a $325 million resort in the Kohanaiki area by local developer Tom Yamamoto and the Japan-based company Nansei Hawaii. We have a small problem now in that uh, Nansei doesn't want the mediation to be public. One of our a coalition of native Hawaiians and surfers calling themselves the Protect Kohanaiki Ohana has organized to stop Nansei. They claim the development will destroy the remains of an ancient Hawaiian village, its burial sites and fish ponds, as well as the habitat of the endangered Hawaiian stilt. Up the road from Kohanaiki is the Hyatt Regency Waikoloa. This $360 million resort with its tram system, electric boats, and controversial dolphin pool has drawn criticism for its extravagance and insensitivity to the environment and surrounding community. Protect Kohanaiki is concerned that Nansei's resort could have a similar effect on their community. I have been coming to this area for all my life, and now I bring my children here and my grandchildren here. Native activist Olga Nauka. We come here to learn and teach and also, you know, we get sustenance from the ocean and from the ponds. But we teach our children how to gather the correct way and what to look for in the seaweed, in the fishes, and a lot of the shellfish that we have here too. So with development coming in, this food sustenance could be destroyed and the learning process could be destroyed as far as how we do it traditionally. We as Hawaiians respect people, you know, their cultures their traditions, and we in turn expect the same. But for many, many years, they keep stepping on our lands, they keep stepping on our rights. I originally became involved because I'm a surfer. I surfed this area and I wanted to be sure that access was kept open. But after finding out all this information from my Hawaiian friends, uh, it's a much bigger issue. Surfer Stephen Martin. And what bothers me about this development is the uh, total disregard for the Hawaiian culture and the Hawaiian history. Um, this is a very significant area here. It's been shown uh, the archaeological sites, the burial sites are very important, uh, the ponds, the endangered birds. Uh, there's many issues here that have not been resolved. And to have a foreign investment company, a Japanese foreign investment company, come in and dictate to us what they're going to do with this land when they're quite aware of the significance of it is, um, is a shameful act. These islands of Hawaii has been bombarded and overwhelmed with development. And in this area, they want to put on a big condo hotel development. They also come in and say that they want us to relate with the tourists here and show our aloha spirit. You don't just say you can buy aloha. It's something that's given free, it's from the heart. And to have development come in, constantly coming in by the big buck, the big buck talks. So they wanna just go ahead and build a hotel and it doesn't matter who cares or who doesn't care about their tradition, their culture, but we do care. And we care enough to say, stop it, enough already. At the end of 1991, Nansei, Hawaii, remained committed to building its resort. Meanwhile, throughout the islands, other communities are fighting similar battles against development.
Native Hawaiians have the lowest median family income of all of the state's ethnic groups. Typically, many must work two jobs to support their families. Many live in what most Americans would call dire poverty. Since the demise of the pineapple and sugarcane industries, which have moved to South America and the Philippines, undesirable factory work or employment in the hotel industry as maids or maintenance workers now provide most of the unskilled labor opportunities. More than 2,000 native Hawaiians live in cardboard boxes, rusted cars, or tents on the beach. Although Congress created the Hawaiian Homes Commission in 1921 to provide land for the native population, 21,000 families, 80% of the applicants, are still waiting for their promised lands. The thing about the situation in Hawaii is that the native Hawaiian people should be the wealthiest of all of America's native people. Attorney Mililani Trask. The situation that we have with regards to homelessness, our prison population, the highest pre- and postnatal death losses in the United States, are, this situation is not one that should be occurring now, given the vastness of our lands and natural resources. But history demonstrates that the state and the federal government have utilized these lands and resources for public purposes, and so the Native people, as wards, currently live in a state of, of tragedy and poverty. When you understand that, you can, I think, understand more fully the reason for the Native outcry at this time. It's a situation of dire urgency for our people. I guess all my life uh, I've been struggling, and I go for ask for help from people, I guess, from America. And all they, all, they could tell me is that they could try to see into it. They could try to see into it. Until today is all they ever told me. <laughs> and the best part about it is that I went, I went to the service for defend our country, America. And in return, that's all they ever told me is they'll see into it. And nothing that I ever asked that they ever did try to help me with till today. I'm still battling with them. Louis Pelicani, a military veteran and skilled net fisherman, recently lost his job at a nearby sugar plantation. After being refused welfare, he could no longer afford to keep his family of 10 in a one-bedroom apartment in town. Yeah, small lady, Laurie. And Hi, Dudu. Start from the oldest one is Malia, then Delson, then Leighton, oh no, wait, Maria, then Leighton, then Melissa, then Buki, and then Bud down here. This is my junior. And this is the last one, Lani, another girl. Have any more? Uh, not right away. <laughs> not right away. Lewis moved his family to King's Landing near the Hilo Airport, where nine other families have taken a stand against the state and the Hawaiian Homes Commission. Ignoring the law and rejecting the commission's waiting list, they have claimed plots of land for themselves and created their own village. Three times over the past 10 years, the commission has attempted to evict them, but the villagers remain committed in their resistance and their efforts to build their lives in King's Landing. Some say they are prepared to die to defend their new homes. King's Landing resident, James Iopa. Right now, I mean, here I'm, I'm a free man. I change a lot. Me and my children built this house. We build it by ourselves, you know, with our own income, whatever income we have, or whatever friends we have that can supply us the lumber. You know, that's all I, I mean, you know. I'd rather stay in here than being out there. Well, I gotta fight, uh, what you call it? Pressure, pure pressure. Found out that in here, I can be myself, which out there, I gotta impress other people. I cannot be myself. Basically, I think you're looking at Hawaiian juice right here. We got squeezed out of the pulp of life out there in the American-induced system. Uh, you know, to be an American, you had to have left someplace that you had a hard life to seek a better life. The opposite happened to us. You know, we was here first, and then we got squeezed out 
Those Hawaiians out there who are humbly waiting in line for permission from the American bureaucracy are dying out there. And, they, and that's why they, they're actually mad with us, because we refuse to die humbly and wait for permission from somebody who's dumber than us, who's more ignorant than us, and represents um, a fallacy of democracy. But all we end up with the, is with the hypocrisy of democracy. As Aboriginal, indigenous, the first clan nation here, you know, that we shouldn't have to succumb by force. You know, you know, we've been forced into this way. And if you can do well or better by cheating the system, it should be, it should be our, our decision. And not be, we should not be policed by um, Saddam Hussein. I mean, wrong. Saddam mm -hmm. Hussein is for Kuwait. For us, it's Uncle Sam. Skippy Ioane is the unofficial leader and philosopher of the King's Landing community. I'm a Vietnam veteran. My father is a Korean War veteran. He, knew, he got shrapnel in the ear. My grandfather is a World War I veteran. The Hawaiians always going off to the war. And um, I, I really feel raped. So when I went to Vietnam, and then, I, you know, one time, I was watching the people eat. So I asked them, you know, oh, what, what you eating? And then they, we talking and they said, they asked me if I like eat. I said, oh yeah, because I, I look at the food, I can smell them, smell good. So I, see, I went right in a circle and I started eating with them and then they, they looked because I can squat like that. See, I can, I can sit down like that and eat. And then use chopsticks and I was just going to town. And so it, from there, they, they, they asked me, you know, if I was Japanese, I said, no. Chinese, I said, no. They said, well, well, what you are the Hawaiian, the Hawaiian, Hawaiian. So I draw on the, I draw on the ground, um, the continent Asia, and then the continent North America, and I drew a dot right in the middle. I said, me here, you here, here America. So the the, the ladies, was, they was all hooch maids. They tell me, well, why you come? You know, well, why you here? So I said, well, I'm an American. She tell me, then well, why why I here? Well, you know. You're not them. Then I would say, no, 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 we're Americans. He said, no, 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 you're not. You're over here in the ocean. And we would argue in a little while, you know. But it stuck in my head that she saw the picture so clear. So then I started chewing on that, chewing on that. From talking to these people in a war, I slowly but surely started unmasking the whiteness of me and bringing back out the brown. You know, just throwing all these American things. And, they, and half of them are lies. They're, they're, well, they built. They lie to the Indian, you know, then that's all. I, I, I don't have to, you know, say anything more. Just follow that trail. That's the same thing happened to us. I, I just feel that people of color have been set up, you know. We've been set up. Skippy and his wife, Carol, struggle to raise their five daughters on his military disability payments and her teacher's salary. Now, a lot of our troubles had come when the Christian faith came. I used to be Christian. I was a Catholic, altar boy. But I never quite believed them, you know. I never really did quite believe them. For me to accept back into me my, my Hawaiian gods, I can see the ocean is a god, the, the rock is a god, and I'm a child of God. That's why Hawaiian is kekioka aina, and aina is earth and the trees are my brothers. And when I, when, I come, when I came back to this village, um, they just all fell in sync. And I've been happy ever since. See, in this village, we feel that you have to feel yourself as the, the Hawaiian in your spirit. And when your spirit becomes strong, it's just like doing your push-ups, your spiritual push-ups. You find yourself easily adapting to this type of life. Spiritually and physically, I've come back. In the things that is Hawaiian, and, and, the, and you've been kept out the door, you should break the lock and go home. And that's what I think. The future of King's Landing remains a question mark. Skippy and the other villagers live each day with the threat of being forcibly evicted 
and having their homes bulldozed, which has been the fate of other similar settlements. The last 15 years have seen a resurgence of interest, pride, and participation in traditional Hawaiian culture. The number of young Hawaiians as well as locals learning hula and other Hawaiian arts has continued to rise. The native culture encourages respect for elders and stresses the importance of passing on traditional ways to the young. A good example of this can be found in Waipio Valley, one of the most remote and beautiful spots on the island, where another Vietnam veteran, a farmer named Kia Fronda, has dedicated himself to teaching young people how to plant and harvest taro, the staple of the Hawaiian diet. It started when I was about three years old. We used to come to my grandfather's place. There was a small little creek, something like what we have over here. And that's where I would always sit, and I would listen to the river. And I always remember this being very comfortable and very secure, this secure feeling. And I would always come back to this little cocoon and be calm and peaceful again. So after everything was finished, school and Air Force, I already made up my mind that I'd come back and uh, rejuvenate my grandfather's farm, how it was before. But this time, it won't be for money-making. It would be for the children. Who else wants to go around? OK, you guys still have to leave. Yeah? OK. Go After she's done with her, we're going to move this to you. OK, well, okay the next new line is starting, OK? Nice cut you star. You're going to be a good farm woman. This area is called Pu'ueo. And um, its main purpose is taro cultivation. It's been in the ohana, or the family, for a long time. University student Kanani Aton. We just finished um, planting the new uh, kuli, or the new um, sprouts, that will be cultivated for a year, and then will be harvested um, a year's time from now. It's used for many purposes. You can steam it, and then you kui it, or you pound it, and it comes into a pasty substance called poi. And um, you can eat it with fish, you can eat it with um, um, vegetables, anything. It's like rice or like mashed potatoes. You can eat virtually the entire plant. The plant is also used for uh, medicinal purposes too. Like um, if you have a sore back, you can use a certain part of the the kalo and, and um, apply it there. Yeah. Its juices and its um, yeah. some substance inside of it Thank cause you. it to heal you. It's our mainstay. It's our staple. Um, it's our life source. 
song about different types of tarot. Written for Auntie Edith Kanakaole before she passed away. Professor Haunani K. Trask. Aloha means love, and in the context of Aloha Aina, it means love for the land. So, in Hawaiian creation beliefs, the land gives birth to the islands, the islands give birth to the taro, the taro gives birth to the people. So, the land feeds us, and our responsibility is to care for the land. <laughs> Activist Palikapu Deadman. Being Hawaiian to me is, is one of the hardest things to be today. I, I'm finding that out. I, I was raised and conditioned as our education system does to make us become non-Hawaiians. The sad thing is that we get educated in schools and learn about ourselves. But we learn how we were sacrilegious or how we were savages, real negative things. We don't learn about how proud we should really be. We don't learn about things that instill values in us. There are important things that has to stay with this race of people. And spirituality in the indigenous people is one of the most important things, I think. And history has shown that if you kill the spirit of an indigenous person, then you really have killed a person. <laughs> hundred or two hundred years ago, the Hawaiian had 400,000 gods, which means that each of them had a deity, each of them had a personal god. Eventually, you know, people were baptized or became converted into Christianity, Buddhism, you know, other religions that were introduced into Hawaii or brought into Hawaii at that time. Hula master Pualani Kanahele. The only deity that was left was, was Pele. And uh, the only reason that Pele was so strong is because she's so visible and she's so demanding when she is visible. Pele is the deity of, of the volcano. Her function then is to create new land. Her function is to go into the bowels of the earth, pull up what we call magma. In English, it's called lava, but in Hawaiian, it continues to be, to be called Pele. She is really the deity that, that has the most respect um, and has the most um, influence on lives, not only Big Island lives, but, but elsewhere. Not only with the native Hawaiian either, or those of the Pele family. I mean, it's, it's a respect that people who grow up here or people who come to love Hawaii really get to appreciate and, and respect. For those of us who live here, we can see that there is a, a life force, a very strong and powerful life force. And that life force is Pele. Pele is believed in by thousands of Hawaiians and people throughout the state believe in her and respect her. 
she's a very powerful life force for us, a source of mana for us as Hawaiian people. What is mana? Mana is strength and power. This is the Kilauea Crater, which many Hawaiians believe to be the home of Pele. Pele is at the center of one of the most controversial environmental and political battles in the state's history. Hawaii is the nation's most oil-dependent state. To continue its rapid growth, it must acquire other energy resources. The state has undertaken an ambitious $2 to $4 billion geothermal energy program which proposes to harness volcanic steam to generate up to 500 megawatts of power. This project has commenced with the first of hundreds of proposed drill sites in the Waokele Opuna forest, just 21 miles from the Kilauea crater and seven miles from the most recent lava flows. Developed by the Wyoming-based True Mid-Pacific Geothermal, it is supported by the state's part Hawaiian governor, John Waihe'e, and its powerful senior senator, Daniel Inoue. Proponents say it will be a clean and efficient solution to the state's energy problems. Opponents say it will be toxic, costly, and a potential ecological disaster. A group of Hawaiian activists calling themselves the Pillar Defense Fund say it is an act of sacrilege. I look and say that my God is not for sale and you can't put a meter on it. And they're saying that they have a right to do that as it'll take care of the population of Hawaii. It's for the needs of everybody in Hawaii. And I'm saying that the Hawaiian has their needs too. So we believe that the goddess Pele is manifest here in the Kilauea volcano. This is her body form. The steam, which they want to tap for geothermal energy, is her life force, it's her mana. And so to tap into this volcano is a terrible desecration and violation. In Hawaiian, it's a sense of lokahi, a sense of whole and harmony. Um, we have to be in balance with nature and with our gods and with ourselves. And if anything is, is damaged, then it creates an imbalance. And we are obligated to heal that damage. Yeah, they knew the Pele Defense Fund, led by University Professor Daviana McGregor, Physician Noah Emmett Aluli, and Big Island activist Palikapu Dedman, attempted to obtain legal injunctions against the geothermal development based on religious and cultural grounds as protected by the First Amendment. We see geothermal development or the use of, of, of Pele's power, her, her steam, her, her mana, as an insult to Native Hawaiian thinking. Roger Uveling, Department of Business and Economic Development. The state has uh, bent over backwards in an effort to try to accommodate all of the Native Hawaiian claims from gathering rights to religious practices. We have accommodated as much as we can, I think. Alan Kuwada, spokesman for True Geothermal. To curb activity on the property because of those to accommodate that religious belief would be a serious and I think an unreasonable accommodation. The Pelly Defense Fund took this to the, to the uh, as high as the state Supreme Court and were ruled against. They then appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court denied hearing the case and uh, or declined to hear the case and let the state Supreme Court ruling stand. Uh, and that indicated that we could proceed, that it was not an infringement upon their religion. We have 
the permission from the government now to develop up to 100 megawatts of power in that area. The protests that have been occurring started almost from the first day that the project was proposed to the public. And the protests will continue, but, and, and selfishly I may say, but I don't think that it'll stop the project. After the defeat of their religious case in the state Supreme Court, the Pele Defense Fund stepped up its efforts and aligned with the local Rainforest Action Network and Greenpeace, two environmental groups opposed to the geothermal development site because it cuts into and threatens the Wau Kele Opuna Forest, one of the last tropical lowland rainforests in the United States. Right there along with us, and she's been erupting and showing her support since 83 too. And we are glad that you are here and we'll continue the, the work together to, till we stop geothermal energy. Mahalo and aloha. Rainforest Action Network's Annie Savetics. We feel in all of our efforts across the world to preserve rainforests, nothing can be more important um, morally than taking care of our own right here at home. So we, can, we have the opportunity to practice what we preach, set an example for the rest of the world. We're not going to allow inappropriate development to happen here. We're not going to allow native rights to be trampled here at home. What is this? Well, this is a protest against the plan bulldozing, uh, further bulldozing of the Waikaleo Puna rainforest. Well, the plan is to stay here and to uh, try to prevent the bulldozers from getting into the forest and try to prevent any more trees from being killed in the forest. Well, uh, we've got a few ideas. The Waokele Opuna rainforest is regularly patrolled by the local police who fear the protesters will attempt an attack on the geothermal drill. Nearby, deep in the forest, is a botanist named Bill Mull who has devoted the last 20 years to studying the plant life of the area. This forest evolved in the absence of big animals. And so all the plants and animals in it are not accustomed to big animals like us. And so when we come in here, uh, there are no defenses against us. This reflects the uniqueness of this place. Virtually everything we're looking at is unique to Hawaii. It isn't found anywhere else. This is Manono, a member of the coffee family. Uh, this is Pilo, another member of the coffee family. Here's a native lobelia that has fuzzy leaves. It's very, very petable. Now there's a cute little flower here. Labordia with the two little yellow flowers. Here's a native mint. We have maybe 140 kinds of native mints in Hawaii. Here's a cute one, Peperomia. And they hide, their, they hide their beauty under their leaves. Where they wear little red petticoats underneath. Uh, they also taste good. If you, uh, if you want to nibble one of these, you'll see a nice feel, a sense of nice spicy taste to them. They're great in a tossed salad, as a matter of fact. <laughs> we can look in a Hawaiian forest and find great beauty here if our eye is set right. It's a green place with many different textures, many small little things where you have to get your nose down and eyeball little things very closely to see what's happening there. But if you have that patience to pursue the small beauties that make up this large forest, then you can come to uh, appreciate it. There are the pragmatic sides to this as well. This is a gene bank, not only for the perpetuation of the forest itself, but as direct potential human resources to use in agriculture or in medicine uh, in all kinds of ways. So this is a unique treasure. Just because we don't yet know how to use it uh, doesn't mean that we can just wantonly destroy it without conscience, without thought to future generations. The forest area near the geothermal site is also used by native Hawaiians who gather food, herbal medicines, and materials for traditional decorations. Malama, come. Come, Malama. Henry, Henry, 
This is Emily Naeole. Part of her livelihood depends on the material she gathers in the forest. When I go inside the forest, I feel very peaceful. You know, I, I, um, I love all the things that's in there. And uh, they're just so natural. And uh, I don't like a big, I don't like things to come and destroy it. You know, sometimes the men with plenty of money destroys a lot of things. I was watching the news and uh, it showed the geothermal drill. And uh, to me, it would look like a big monster, you know, because I'm all these trees and they would build those room and then now they created this big thing. And so I was, uh, I felt like it, it, it was invading us. Emily lives in the small town of Pahoa, two and a half miles from the geothermal site. She makes and sells lays for $15 to $25 a piece. Her husband, Harold, has been unable to find work locally. They live on the town's main road in this rented house with their three daughters and new son. In December 1989, Emily was one of 39 protesters who entered the geothermal site and were arrested for trespassing. She is also one of 11 women who are suing the county, claiming they were victims of an illegal strip search which was viewed, unbeknownst to them, by several male police officers via one of the station's video cameras. I feel like if I can do anything to help, you know, make things better, and I got to. I feel like this is just men totally in power. They have the plane is power trip. And because they have a lot of money, then they can't play the power trip. Um, and so, you know, it, 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 it's a hard one. We got to keep, you know, we got to keep poking at them, but then uh, it, it, it is really hard. And they're going to do anything in their power to um, try to knock us back down. You know, just like what's happening to Oahu or to some of the other islands. You know, we still, that's why a lot of the people come from the mainland because they want to come to paradise. And if we don't save what is left from paradise, it won't be. And there we go. <laughs> eh ho mai, eh ho mai. After numerous legal actions and demonstrations, the protesters have gained some ground. In 1991, the U.S. District Court ordered a comprehensive environmental impact study before more federal monies are spent. In addition, Concern has been raised over the potential of dangerous levels of hydrogen sulfide emissions from the drilling and the site's proximity to the recent lava flows. Nonetheless, with $155 million of public and private monies already invested, the state is determined to move ahead with its geothermal program. Hello, my name is Alan Kawada. I'd like to ask everyone today to please pay attention to what I'm going to say. The protests continue as True Mid-Pacific Geothermal prepares to expand its operation into other parts of the Waukele Opuna rainforest. To me, it's very important to save the rainforest. Um, I don't know where else we can go, you know, because I, I have no money to travel, right? And so this is the only rainforest I'm going to have. And uh, that's why it's very important, you know, to save it. 
our survival as Hawaiians is dependent on the survival of the life forces and the deities. So the existence of Pele is a very important part of the continuation of Native Hawaiian people. And we have lost so much as a people. Um, we feel desperate as a people. Uh, in our generation, we feel a little desperate. We've lost all our land uh, to developers and before that to the missionary businesses. I mean, everything has gone wrong for Hawaiians. Who is powerless? Who does not have control? Who has no claim or even any voice in courts or in the, or in the, um, in the general political discussion? It's Native Hawaiians. Nobody asks us our opinions. They buy a piece of land, they bring in their culture, they plop whatever on it, buildings or whatever, and they don't ask us, what did you do here? You know, was this used for a special kind of gathering, special kind of fish? Was this a, a place where they did ceremonies? They do their environmental studies, they bring archaeologists to give their opinion. They never ask the culturists. They never ask people who have lived there on that land for, for many years and many generations their opinion or how important that piece of land is to us. And because of that, it's difficult for us to you know, keep living comfortably with this imposing society. After all, this is our ancestral land. This is not the ancestral land of Asians, of white people, or of anybody who is not Hawaiian. And we're not saying to non-Hawaiians, you have to get out of Hawaii, although certainly I would like if more of them left Hawaii. What we are saying is we have identifiable lands that in American law belong to us. We are not using them. We are not controlling them. We should have those lands under our control, and non-Hawaiians should respect that. What we're trying to say to the U.S. Congress and to all other uh, American people and also internationally is that the time has come to recognize that there is a native people on this land and to realize that we are quickly passing away with other native species. We are not asking for entitlements that other people do not have but unless our culture and our religious practices are protected and unless there is some way that our people can return to the land to be self-governing we are on the verge of extinction. We feel that it is very important that we win. We win one, one that would set the direction, perhaps, for all future development, and one that would bring in culture, religion, tradition as one of those costs that need to be well taken care of before development is allowed, and we hurt once again, and we suffer. The Native Hawaiians on this island that I've learned in the struggles and what we share and talk about is love for what we are and who, where we at, and the love for the children to have and inherit all of this. But for Big Island people, we're the strongest in sharing what we fight for. We're the strongest in caring what we fight for. And we really want the children to have a better life than we do. Aloha is the Hawaiian word for love. Aloha spirit promotes kindness, patience, and the sharing of one's home, food, and friendship. These days, many Hawaiians cannot help but feel that their aloha spirit has been abused. Recently, many have begun calling for sovereign status to break away from the state of Hawaii's jurisdiction and govern themselves as Native American tribes do. Throughout Hawaii, on the Big Island, on Oahu, Maui, Kauai, and Molokai, Native Hawaiians are revitalizing their culture, asserting their rights, proclaiming their ancestry with new pride. <laughs> 
Watching the waves, the rolling sands that kiss the shore. And now my heart will be forevermore. And your love that has gone away will come back to me. Eleana, igapini kai o kelia. Ene ene e mai kaua e pini. Ke kau mai na o ka mai. Thank you. 